going to continue with the message of being inter interdependent with the Holy Spirit, leaving God's life with Him and by Him. You know, we need God's help and His ability to live the life that He has given us. Because if we are not living the life that He has given us, we're not actually living the Christian life. We need His help for all things. That's why in the Bible, there's a, there's a verse that says, and God will meet your needs according. God will meet all your needs, not just some, but all your needs according to His glorious riches in Christ. Amen? Amen. I'm going to be touching on a number of things in this journey of what it looks like to be interdependent with the Holy Spirit, with God. You know, when we come into this world as babies, we are 100% dependent upon our parents. There is no interdependence. We just depend on them. Without them, we are in trouble. Unless, of course, God intervenes uh, through someone else. But as the child begins to grow older and becomes aware and develops uh, and, and develops mentally, they transition and they grow in their ability to be responsible. So what you would give uh, a 10 year old boy would be different to what you would give a, uh, a baby. And what you would expect from a 10 year old boy would be different to what you would expect from a baby. And what you would expect from a young man that's 20 is different to what you would expect from a child that's 10. And I believe it's this year we're celebrating, is it 25 years? Yeah. So we are in a season, in a state of growing up. Amen? Amen. So this is a message for grown-ups who are seeking to no longer be like babies, depending on God only, so to speak. But now we can reach a place where God is looking to us and expecting us to deliver. Amen? Amen? If a baby's room is messy, you clean the baby's room. If a 10-year-old boy, his room is messy, you can tell that child, clean your own room. It's different. You see? In the same way with God, there are some things that He will do for us when we are babies. But as we grow older, He can say, you can handle that now. You can deal with that. You now know who you are. Amen? Amen. So there is a, a progression where we need to change our language. The language of a baby is different to the language of a young man in the natural. And the language of us as Christians, as we grow in here, should be different to the language of a baby. Amen. Amen? Amen. So, it's an honor to know that God thinks highly of us. It's an honor to know that God is looking to us. You know what? what you know um, when Saul messed up and he threw the kingdom away, and this and God sent uh, Samuel to Saul. He said to Saul. Guess what? You have been replaced, but I have found a man. Which means God is always looking. He has many, many babies. He has many, many children. But he is looking for someone he can entrust. He is looking for someone who he can develop an interdependent relationship. He said about David, I have found a man in whom I know he will do everything I require. I have found a man, before even David fulfilled what God had said about him, God was already saying things about him, saying, this person, I have found in him the qualities required. I know that anything I want him to do, he will do. Amen? I decree and declare for you. As I see him as a Pentecostal church, anything that God wants you to do, you will do it in Jesus' name. Amen. You will do it in Jesus' name. Amen. You will do it in Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. So, let's
let's go to the next slide. I want to touch on this word called yield. What it means to yield. So yielding. Because that's part of the journey. Learning how to yield. You know, a baby gets what it wants. And you give them the food, you wipe, you wipe, wipe it clean, you know. A baby will get what it wants based on the cry, based on the situation. Okay? But it is not, it's wired to love, but it's very self-centered. Babies are 100 percent self-centered. They don't care if you're at a funeral. If there's a moment of silence. If they want if they want food or they've done something, they will let you know. Yeah? They are very self-centered. Okay? So the journey of inter when we become Christians, we may be like, God help me, God help me, God help me, God help me, I'm in trouble, I'm in trouble, come through, come through. Okay. God sees your situation. He will come through. He will help. He will come through. He will help. But as we as we begin to grow, there begins to be a shift where now an interdependent relationship looks like actually, God, what, what is it that you want from me? You know when you're driving, you know, you see that sign, give way. You know what that means, yeah? Mm. It means that you need to carry. Who knows? Can someone tell me what this means? Give way, this sign. The meaning of it. Stop and what? Sorry? Stop and look or allow. Yes. You allow other cars to go. If it's an oncoming vehicle, you allow it. You give it priority. And you know what? Something I like about the UK, I'll admit, definitely, is I think that in the UK, the style of driving is, is civilized. That's true. And, I mean, I've been to some other countries where, like, uh, I mean, I there's one country I've been to, I'm not even going to name it, but I don't even know what they have traffic lights. Because red means nothing, they still go. <laughs> you know, when you cross the road, you have to run, whether it's red, yellow, orange, it's like survival of the fittest, the quickest survive, you know? It's, it's a jungle. So here, I've noticed that the, the, the pattern, in general, I mean, London is exceptional, there's, oh no, there's, a, there's some madness out there, but in general, there's a culture of giving way. Yeah, you let the person go, we all get that. And, and because it's done to us, we, we do it back, okay? Giving way. In the journey of God, God is looking for us to transition from self-dependence. Because when before we are saved, we, before we know Jesus, the whole world teaches us that you need to rely on yourself. Believe in yourself. It's even in the films. Trust in your heart. Follow yourself. Try hard. Be confident. Work hard and you will succeed. And all these slogans make you think that it's up to you. It's down to you. Whereas God is looking for you and I to begin to transition from self-dependence to God-dependence. And if you learn to begin to become God-dependent, it means you have to surrender your will. Amen. You have to surrender your will. So to yield is to give way to the will of another. To stop in order to allow other, other vehicles to go past. Um, you are to the Holy Spirit, it looks like you're no longer depending on your self-effort. Instead of depending on your self-effort, you are depending on God's ability to get things done. And this is why He comes into the equation. But because we are so wired, we are so used to getting things done in our own way, how we like it done, it's a journey to transition. God is looking for us to learn how to yield. Amen. 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 To yield. And the Holy Spirit is so, he's so gentle. He may prompt you. He may ask you. He may, he, may, he, may, he may direct you. And many of us, including myself, will be quick to say no, or dismiss it, or just ignore it, and do whatever you plan to do. And he may retreat, but in his mercy, he'll come back again. 
and he may use someone else. Change direction. Change the course. And thank there are, by God's grace, there have been some moments when I have listened. And when I have listened, it's proved very fruitful or very um, very positive or very beneficial for me. I remember when he saved me from a car accident because I listened to him not to go to the to the uh, church to the, to the church that my friend was going to. She wanted to take me to her church. I was at university. And as I was waking up, there was a thought and it said, Don't go. Go to the church you normally go to. I didn't realise that in not going with her, which would have been my first time, I avoided a serious car accident and that car was written off and the point of impact was the driver's side, where the, the passenger side, where I would have been seated. That's one example of a time where I responded. Thank God for his mercy. Amen. 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 I honestly believe that when it comes to sudden accidents and things like that, God will speak to his children. But most, many, many of us, for whatever reason, we may dismiss it and may not listen. And something may happen. But it doesn't change the loving nature of God. If things happen, God can restore, can help, can heal. But he is far more interested in our well-being than we think he is. Amen. 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 So learning to yield is, 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 is beginning to uh, rely on God's ability. It's beginning to surrender. It's beginning to, listen to this, choose to see Jesus Christ as your source. Amen. Your source. Everyone say, my source. My source is Christ. The journey of me to yielding is choosing to see that Christ Jesus is your source for all things. The more you see him as your source for all things, the more easier it is to take this pathway of yielding. Next slide. You know, I stumbled into Revelation. And it's this. Whoever feels you, leads you. So we've got above, let's say it's a bottle of champagne or something, some alcohol is overflowing. And beneath we have someone who's drinking and driving. And as you can see, it's becoming blurry. His sight of vision is becoming blurry. Because how many of you know, even they, they say in, in England, when you are under the influence, of alcohol while driving, you are no longer driving the car because the alcohol is driving you. Funny is, you know that there are some alcohol called spirits. I find it quite interesting. I don't think it's an accident. You know, there's a verse in, the, in, in, in Ephesians that says, "Do not get on, do not get drunk on wine, but be filled with the Spirit." That was a command. Be filled with the Spirit. God used that passage to show that there is a, a spiritual similarity to alcohol yeah. and the impact that alcohol has. So being filled with the Spirit has a similar impact in the spiritual realm to what alcohol has in the physical realm on your, within your body. When you are filled with alcohol, someone else is beginning to something else. A spirit <laughs> is beginning to direct you. You are under the influence of something else. And in the same way, when someone becomes filled with the Holy Spirit, you are now coming under the influence of God himself. Amen? And as a result, how you behave is different. As a result, how you handle situations is different. I don't know if any of you have, have, have ever seen people that have fallen in the Spirit, people that have been drunk with the Holy Spirit. There's, sometimes they stumble, sometimes they fall, sometimes they laugh, sometimes they, they behave in ways that they maybe would not behave if they weren't filled. And if you look at someone who's drunk, same thing. Some, some people will cry, some people will sing, some people will, you know, they will behave in a way that's different to how they were without the influence. 
So whoever fails you, and this is spiritually true, because we as human beings, we are like containers. And because we are containers, we are constantly being filled with spiritual things. Yeah. And there are two sources in the realm of the spirit. There's the kingdom of God, the word of God, angels, Jesus, the Holy Spirit, and then there's the kingdom of darkness, Satan, demons, or call it what you will. There's only two sources, there's not a third source. And as human beings, based on what we are allowing our heart to be exposed to, we are either being filled with the things of God or filled with the things of the world. There's no middle, there's no middle line. So, essentially, this whole concept of yielding is everyone yields. Yeah. There's no one, there's no human being that doesn't yield. There's no human, basically, there's no human being that lives a life independent from any spirit. I promise you this. If you are not yielding to God and the things of God and the way of God, you are yielding to the things of the enemy and the way of the enemy and the kingdom of darkness. Don't fool yourself into thinking, if I just do what I want and people leave me alone, I will be how I want to be, that you are independent of, of any kind of influence. You have been influenced. You have been someone is needs some, something, someone is causing you to yield. So this isn't a question of me begging you to yield to the Holy Spirit is me making it very clear and simple that you are either yielding to God and the ways of God or you are yielding to the enemy and the ways of the enemy. There's no great line. There's no little line. That's right. Amen. Amen. That's the truth. Amen. And it's good that you become aware of the truth because the truth sets you free. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. So why not allow the Holy Spirit to, to lead you and to guide you? Because when He leads you and guides you, He leads you in safe pastures, amen? amen? He causes you to discover who you are. He causes you to realize that you're stronger than you think you are when you depend on Him. You can do all things through Christ Jesus who strengthens you. He gives you courage and boldness. He makes you believe again, breathe again. If you've fallen, He'll tell you get up because a righteous man can fall and seven times get back up again. Amen? amen. He will cause you to that your identity is not found in your mistakes, but your identity is found in what Jesus Christ accomplished. Therefore, the gift of righteousness is a gift for you, not connected to your behavior, but connected to what Jesus Christ accomplished. Amen. 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 Because you should realize that you are born of God. You carry the DNA of God. You carry the gift. You carry the breath of the Holy Spirit. The greater is He that is in you than He that is in the world. Amen. Life. This is in Luke chapter 3, verse 21, 22, and then four, chapter 4, verse 1. Now when all the people were baptized, and when Jesus also had been baptized and was praying, the heavens were opened, and the Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form, like a dove. And a voice came from heaven. You are my beloved son, to you I am well pleased. And Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit in the wilderness for 40 days, being tempted by the devil. I discovered here, so we're in a situation where Jesus, number one, is filled. What happens after he is filled? He is what? He led. So, Believers can own, I promise you, if there is a believer who is filled with the Holy Spirit, you will be led by him. If you want to learn how to be led by the Spirit, get filled with the Spirit of God. Because the key is learning to be filled. Huh? If you try to follow the Spirit without being, without being filled, it can be hit and miss, on and off. But if you are filled with the Holy Spirit, you will always, always follow Him. Even if it means to, towards a desert. Even if it means towards a barren place. Even if it means 
towards a challenge. Even if it means towards something that takes you outside of your comfort zone. If you are filled with the Spirit, you will always be led by the Spirit. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Amen. Another example is um, in Acts chapter 7, verse 51 to 58. I think it's the next slide, possibly. So we have a situation where Stephen, I'm just going to explain the situation. Stephen is a man, the Bible said he was filled with the Spirit, full of faith, and many other good things. But basically, he's been challenged for his faith. His faith is under attack. His faith has been scrutinized. And he's saying things to the point where he says, what point where he says, um, uh, you always resist the Holy Spirit. You stiff necked people are circumcised in heart and ears. You always resist the Holy Spirit. He's talking to the Pharisees. He's talking to the Sadducees. He's talking to people who, if they want to, they can arrange to kill you by staring at the crowd. And he's telling them you are stiff necked. He is telling them you always resist the Holy Spirit. He's telling them some very strong words. Amen? Amen. But, when they are, it says, it, 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 you'll find later in the second paragraph. Now, when they heard these things, they were enraged and they grounded their teeth. But he, full of the Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And he said, Behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. But they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and rushed, that they rushed at him. What this tells me is this. Even in the face of danger and what looks like death, if you are filled with the Spirit, you'll behave like God. Amen. Yes. You won't fear. You won't back down. He, 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 in fact, he wasn't even self-conscious and he wasn't conscious of people. He was so filled, he began to see in the Spirit. You know, I'm reminded of Elisha. The story of Elisha is, Elisha wakes up one morning and his servant wakes him up and says, Master, we are surrounded by a whole troop of armies. We are in trouble. They've come to get us. And Elisha's not panicking like the servant. The only thing Elisha says is, God open his eyes. Because there, there are more for us than there are against us. Amen. You, saw, you see, fear is connected to what you see and know. If you are aware that God is in you and with you and for you, then you won't fear even if what, what looks to be dangerous is in front of you. Amen? Because when the when, when Jehovah's eyes were open, the whole place was surrounded by innumerable chariots of fire. And do you think he was afraid after that? No. no. So your, your faith and fear is very much hinged on what you see, what you hear, and what you know. If the most dangerous animal was in front of you, and you have been, you had a bad experience, and you and you are about to panic, but suddenly you see Jesus Christ next to you, your response will be different as uh, than it would be if he wasn't there, because you know who's with you. Amen. Amen. So I'm trying to get you to understand that the key to actually living like God and being like God is being filled with the Holy Spirit. Amen. And it's a command. It's not a, a one thing. It's not something where you know, uh, every, you know, when you when you're filled with the Spirit for the first time, it, God pours His His Spirit in, closes the the the, the lid, leaves you be, and says, "Okay, live your life." No, it's a, a in the same way that if you want to get drunk, what do you need to do? Do you know, you don't drink and then get drunk for life, do you? What you drink, you drink, you drink, you drink, and eventually you get drunk, and then it all happens, but then it goes, it fades away, and then you do it again. Yes. Amen? Amen. You, there's, a, there's a cycle to it. Yes. So there is also a cycle to how to be filled with the Spirit of God. Yes. There's a process, but if, if, you, if you commune with Him, and engage with Him, and speak with Him, and pray in tongues, and worship, and spend time with Him, what are you doing? You are positioning yourself. You are letting God 
fit in here. Amen. 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 Next slide. So, this is the top, and it looks like there's an invisible connection. You can't really see what it's connected to, but it's releasing water underneath this pool. But this is what God wants, this is what, how God sees our bodies. And He is the, he is the water that comes forth. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Remember what I said, whatever fills you, leads you. Hmm? Remember, what, uh, I'm reminded of what uh, Peter said to Ananias. Ananias was trying to trick the disciples and trying to get them to think that he, was, that he had given all the money as an offering to the Lord, but he had not. And you know what Peter says? Peter says this, How has Satan so filled your heart that you would lie? So the place of filling is the heart. Everyone say the heart. The heart. My heart, your heart. Yeah? When it is going to either be filled with the spirit and the influence of God or the lies of the enemy. This is, the, this, is, this has always been God's intention. He wants to express himself through you and through me. So what is a conduit? A conduit is a channel for conveying water or other fluid. A person or organization that acts as a channel for the transmission of something. You know, Paul said this. Paul said in the book of Galatians, chapter 2, verse 20, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Now let me ask you this question. When Paul says this, what did he do? What did Paul do to be crucified with Jesus? What, what, what was required of him? He just believed it. He identified. That's all Paul did. He didn't fast. He didn't pray. He just, I, he just chose to believe. I am now, my life, my sinful life, is now dead with Jesus Christ. And it is no longer I, Mr. Self-Dependent, who lives. It is now Christ who is God dependent, who lives in me. Yeah? What would it look like if we began to say this over and over again? Even if our life is fluctuating, we began to say, it is I died with Jesus Christ. Amen. It is no longer I that lives, but Christ Jesus lives in me. Amen. Jesus Christ lives from me, and Jesus Christ lives through me. And we said it again, and we said it again. I died with Jesus Christ. It is no longer I that lives, but Jesus Christ lives in me, and from me, and through me. And the life he lives, he, he lives it by the faith of God. Amen. This is, the, this is a very powerful key to shift our way of thinking. Because often, when we make a mistake, and, we'll, and uh, when we, we stumble, our focus will be what you've done. Our focus will be what I've done. Our focus will not be on who Christ is and what He's done. Our focus, the enemy wants us to focus on what you've done so that you depend on yourself to get yourself out of it. That's the trick of the enemy. If you can get you focusing on yourself, then you have to think that you have to get out of it by yourself. But if you keep on focusing on Christ, His power in you, His life in you, His, 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 His grace in you will work so that you will, become, you will accidentally begin to live more like Jesus than you could ever have done so by intentionality, trusting in your own ability. You will live more like Jesus by accident if you fix your eyes on Him and identify with Him then you would try to live like Him with in your own effort. Because you can't do it in your own effort. Try. I've 
tried it, it doesn't work. You, if you try, if you try, if you think that if you, when you fast and you pray, if you fast and you pray, thinking that it's your self-effort, it, 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 it is because of you that God is now listening to you and God is responding to you. You're going to, you're, you're going to come into a, quite a serious reality check. You know, if you think that everything is hinged on, on what you do, you're, gonna, you're setting yourself up to be upset because you, you cannot measure up. You can't measure up to God's standard. That's why God sent Jesus Christ to be the standard and say, lean on me, identify with me, accept me, I've given you my life. In fact, when you gave your life to Jesus, you gave, it, what it was is, in fact, Jesus gave his life to you. Amen. That's what Christianity is. That when you when you accepted Jesus Christ as your as your Lord, you you acknowledged that Jesus on the cross, God killed you with Jesus, and then when Jesus rose from the dead, God gave you a new life, the life of Jesus Christ. So Jesus Christ is the life that lives inside of you now. Amen. That's Christianity. Leaning on Him, depending on Him, drawing from Him, His ability, His grace, His empowerment. This is the way the God wants to, to, if you can believe it, you'll begin to flow through you. You'll begin to flow through you. He'll begin to flow through you because you're learning to lean on Him. Yeah. Next slide. In the book of Romans, chapter 8, verse 5, it says this For those who live according to the flesh, set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit, set their minds on the things of the Spirit. For to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. Two realms, two dimensions. We have the things of the flesh, and we have the things of the Spirit. And if you live according to the things of the flesh, your mind is set on the things of the flesh. But if you live according to the things of the Spirit, your mind is set on the things of the Spirit. Now, this picture shows that the area that God controls 100% is your spirit. Yeah? And the key so now allowing your spirit to rise up is if the Holy Spirit fills you. When the Holy Spirit fills you, it's like your spirit comes to the forefront and begins to lead your life. Amen? Amen. But if the Holy Spirit is not filling you or you're not in that journey, you will shrink back and the influence of the world and the things of the world can begin to influence you. If you go to the next slide, there's a you will see, on the left is according to the flesh, on the right is according to the spirit. So there's a list. The question you may ask is, how do I know what my mind is set on, or where my mind is set on? Well, if your mind, if your if your mind is set on the things of the flesh, what it looks like is you are more self-conscious and you are more people focused. You, you consume information contrary to the word of God. You lap it up. You live life by self-effort. Trusting in your feelings. It's all about how you feel. You believe in physical reality more than the word of God. Money is your source. You pursue instant gratification. You love the things of this world. So this is a cat this is a list of things. And another symptom, another way of knowing is check what level of peace you have. Because the Bible says, if you are of the flesh, your life is dead. What does that mean? It doesn't mean you're, you're, you're dead, you're, you're physically dead. What it means is what you're experiencing cannot be found in Christ. 
If you're experiencing anxiety and worry, is that in Christ? No. Therefore, that is death. If you're experiencing panic and fear and trauma, is that in Christ? No. Therefore, that is death. As far as anything that is not in Christ is death. Why? Because Jesus Christ is the resurrection and the life. He overcame death. It's hell in the grave. There is nothing. There is no sickness in Christ. There is no. There is no worry in Christ. He is never moved by the things of this world. So death is anything that cannot be found. Christ Jesus. Right. However, if we are living according to the Spirit, we are learning to become more God conscious and Christ centered. Intimacy with the Holy Spirit is our desire and our pursuit. We are consuming God's Word. Our sensitivity to the things of the Spirit is, it, it increases. Our love for the things of God increases. We love the church, the people of God. These are the things that we are seeking. To, to, we are pursuing after God's Word. These are the things that motivate our heart. Yes, 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 yes. If you want to know <coughs> if your mind is set on the things of God or the things of the Spirit, Whatever your mind is, whatever has your full attention is the giveaway. So for example, if you find yourself constantly sleeping in the house of God, but there's, when there's football, you are 100% paying attention, ask yourself, what changed? What happened? Yeah? The Spirit of God releases the desires of God through your life. Amen? Amen. Amen. If you're 100% engaged, if you're watching a music video on MTV, you're listening to, you're, you're watching a program, and you're, uh, uh, it has your attention. But when it comes to the things of God, God is looking for your heart. Amen. And he says, you know what? I love you a lot. I want you to know me. I want to walk in fellowship with you. I'm patient. But choose me. Because if you choose me, I will, and you yield to me, where I'm leading you is a good place. But if you do not choose me, and you do your own thing, even though you belong to me, you are giving the enemy a foothold in your life. You are given access to spirits and influences. You are given the worry, anxiety, death, panic, self-dependency. All the, all the things that the world responds to, you will respond to. That is what the enemy wants to do. And God is here to say, it's time to respond. It's time to rise. It's time to accept the gift. It's time to yield to me. It's time to grow up and learn to depend on... on, 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 on the, it's time to grow up so that I can entrust myself to you. I can lean on you. I can rely on you. I can, I can say, in ICF, I have found men and women who are after my own heart. In ICF, I have found people that will do what I ask. So that if God tells you to give, you give. If God tells you to stop, you stop. If God tells you to honor, you honor. If God tells you to forgive your brother or sister and, and pray for your enemies, you do it. Why? Because you're learning, you're learning to yield. And as you learn to yield, you discover that the, the, the things that you've been praying for, things answers will begin to, to, to flow in your life. Things will begin to happen because you are Good to me. 
is in you. The image of God is in you. You are bearers of the fire. You are bearers of the torch. He lives in you. He lives from you. He lives from you. Wake up! Accept this reality. Stop slumbering. Accept this reality. And rise. 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 Refuse to settle for less. I refuse to settle for ordinary. Thank you.
Amen. Uh-huh. 